Uh, so I'm Ellie, this is Matt. Hello. Just, just in case uh, people weren't sure. And yeah, as Simon said, we're going to dive into some of the new features. In particular, your favorite thing, which is perhaps modeling. Yeah, and modeling. And my favorite thing, which is probably texturing inside of Redshift. So we thought, why not combine our two hobbies in 3D and make some cool stuff? Yeah, so we've got a chance to have a look at some of the, the new potential that is available with the volume modelling tools that we have in Cinema 4D. It's not particularly the change in the volume modelling, it's the fact that we can now add um, vertex maps to uh, non-polygonal objects. So the yes. fact that we can <laughs> finally texture volume models, which is something I'm particularly excited about. Not that I texture much, that's why I handed over to Ellie, but nonetheless, <laughs> the process is much more exciting. So, uh, should we get stuck in? Yes, let's Let's get stuck in. So the, the, the model I'm about to create, as you can see, is you know is, is fairly simple and I'm, it's not going to take me very long to go through the actual process of the volume modeling side of it. But the interesting part of this is going to be how we set up the vertex maps, which will allow sort of interactive selections for us to then um, add materials to various different bits of this, which will then be done in Redshift. Oh, yeah. So, so let's get cracking. So as you can see, I'm going to make an incredibly complicated object. <laughs> Uh, no, one step at a time. I, I, I don't want to overwhelm. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah, we're done. Um, so I'm just going to quickly get some stuff and let's just make the rotation segments for that six. Boom. And let's make that a bit thicker and then let's copy and paste that. And so yeah, we had that. an idea, didn't we? When we we're deciding what we wanted to show, what features, we were like, you know what? Why don't we model like a bit of a sci-fi canister? I had a look on Pinterest and Behance for some kind of inspiration ideas, didn't we? And that's sort of how we came up with this design and with some of the textures as well, which we'll then do in Redshift. So, you know, I'm, I'm not doing anything particularly complicated here, you know, with the volumes, but what the idea is, is that I'm making this out of one single object. So let's get a cube, cubey cube, and shrink it down and then I'm just going to put that in a cloner, which is going to look very odd because I need a radial cloner. It's a bit again. similar to people who draw and they draw through shapes. It's kind of a similar process. Yeah, I kind you're, of sketch as I go. Yeah, you're using these 3D primitives to get an idea of how you're going to create this volume model. And with subtractions and different kind of blending modes, we can create some nice, interesting modeling without having to know advanced modeling, which for me is something that I don't know. You know that anyway. Um, so you can see this is a bit of a mess. So let's do some subtracting. Boom. There we go. And um, it's, yeah, Pixar, uh, uh, pixel art, voxel art. Yeah, it's like one yeah. of those old Minecraft. school games. Yeah, it's fine. Um, let's increase or decrease the resolution of this a smidge so that we can get something. There we go. That's a bit better. So. I'm deliberately setting this up so that we can do, you know, individual parts of this. So we're going to have a base mesh. And what I want to do is make things just a little bit thicker so that we can have glass. And the glass is going to still be part of the volume mesh. Yes, in theory, I could do just another cylinder and put glass on it. But I'm actually going to do this inside of the same volume mesh because we're demonstrating that you can. Um, so volume builder. And I need this one, which I'm going to call glass. Doom. And one of the things that I love about the volume measure is that you can redrag the same element in more than once. So you can see in my thing down the bottom here that I've got the glass in at the bottom, which is the one creating the big base. And I'm going to have this one, which is going to create the secondary part. So I need a folder because I'm going to put that in there and I'm going not as smooth. Um, I need a dilate and erode, not to make it bigger, but to make it smaller. So let's make it minus five. Um, and you can see that that then adds that back. Let's make it minus 15. No. Let's let's go in the middle. Let's get minus 10. Um, and that gives me all in one go. So I've got the outer canister. We've got the, the walls. And then we've got the glass. And all of this is under one single volume me uh, measure. And uh, model builder. And then let's put it in the volume measure. All of the... All of the words. volumes. All of the models. Um, and let's just, let's make a nice smoothie thing, which will make it a bit crazy. Um, lower the voxel distance, increase the iterations a bit, which makes it a bit smoother. And maybe, just maybe have a look at one of these that gives us a finer object. Okay, that's cool. Um, just because I like to make things 
numbered nicely. You I'm like just your round numbers. I like you? my round Whereas numbers. I like I my point, point zero four five, decimal places afterwards. Four, three, eight, I like seven, to make six, it challenging two. for myself. The first 18 digits of pi. Yeah, it's always fun. Um, so the other thing is, is that because I've got a radius, it means that I can uh, easily put something else in there, which I can make the same radius. And again, so I can do that, and I'm going to change the plane. So I'm going to put one up there. Dunk. And copy and paste and do one down the bottom, which may or may not be equidistant, but I'm not going to worry about that. Both of those will go in the volume builder, which is fine, and they will add. I can have a look at both of those. Um, I can decide, okay, let's increase the radius to five of both of those, which gives me a bit of a thicker rim. But of course they're sticking out, whereas I need them to go in. So I can just use the subtract here to remove them. Boom. And very quickly, we've got, what was that? Five minutes, six minutes? We have the canister, okay? Yeah, I wasn't going for the most technical part of the 3D modeling side of this, but this is where the fun part comes in. This is the new vertex mapping stuff. So with our volume measure, we can now go to tags, go to other and add a vertex map. Boom. So previously when we added a material, it would be one material for the whole volume measure for all of those objects you put in. And it was a bit of a nightmare when it came to texturing because you had to do clever things with selections and stuff like that. Whereas now using the vertex maps and using fields, it's going to allow us to blend these materials purely based on this. And we haven't had to do some trickery. No, and we don't have to make anything editable as well, which is of course, when you're doing volume modeling and you just want to throw a couple of textures on it, not necessarily UV unwrap it, but just a couple of textures, you can't do it. It's a real pain, but now it isn't, which is great. So volume measure, vertex map, and let's just for an example, I'm going to create a linear field. And let's just make that linear field that way instead. And there, there you can see, we have a vertex map completely controlled by a field. I disappeared then. You did. I did disappear. Um, and this means that wherever this, you know, the yellow texture, the yellow vertex map is, we have the ability of putting some form of texture map on there. And we can, of course, swap out the linear field or change it to a different one. So I'm just gonna select the linear field and change it maybe to a box field. And that gives us the idea of an inner distance and an outer distance, um, which we can change with remapping and inner offsets so that I can make it, you know, I can lessen the distance between the inner and the outer, which means that the number of polygons that are going to be in that is going to be much smaller. I don't necessarily want it at 100% because that means that there's going to be a definitive crack between parts of the vertex map. Whereas this is gonna give me a slight fade, which means that we can hide some of the things. And you can see that I can move that up and move that down. Um, so I could have the top part if I wanted it one color. And of course, because it's a vertex map, I can copy and paste and second box field, move it down the bottom, go to my vertex map, drag it in, add to add, and then I get both of them. So I can have multiple fields in the same vertex map controlling where I'm able to move this. And because we can then do the material afterwards, we can move the vertex maps around and we can choose where the material is going to appear. For this instance, we're not gonna need to do two separate things because we're gonna do a base material yes. um, in this, which is gonna be really easy. So let's start doing something that's going to be helpful. So let's call this, let's call this, um, glass. Naming your vertex maps in this instance is exceptionally important. One, because otherwise Cinema 4D won't recognize one from the other, and two, when trying to figure out which vertex map you need to put the texture in, you need to know what it's called. Easier. That's very true. And I'm just here to make your life easier. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So with my box field, I'm going to actually change the field to a cylindrical field. And now you can see, hooray, look, I can increase and decrease this, uh, not height, uh, radius, so that I can get the bit that's going to be glass. So oh, I... That was me strange. yesterday. <laughs> I'm just disappearing. Um, so I can get the parts that I need and I can build out on this. And it's, like I say, I'm excited the fact that it is still just one volume mesh. So here we go, we've got one part. Um, the second part light beams? is the light beams. Yeah. So I have the ability of going to tags and then 
other tags, I'm going to create another vertex map, which I've done completely on the wrong object, but that doesn't matter. Um, and I'm going to call this light beams. And once again, because we're using fields, I can drag and drop. Ooh. I think because you created it on the cylinder field. Yeah, I don't like create. that. Let's 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 ignore the positions that that one's created. With on my volume measure, go to <laughs> tags, um, go to other. Oops, missed vertex map, and then let's drag and drop one of the end sides into the vertex map, which is now ignoring me. Vertex map inside. Thank you. This is not what it's done the other four mm. times. I wonder if it's. That is very strange. Very strange. Hang on. Uh... Oh, what radius instead of a long. So go into vertex map. Click that. Then radius. Oh, click I was going for mask down. as well, which is the other thing that we can do as well. Ah. So the sign shape, yes. Thanks, um, thanks Thank you. <laughs> so you can go radius instead of a long. Thank you, Rick, for one of the other things. Um, my spline shape was using the spline itself as a mask. So we'll have to do this twice once again. So I'll drag the other one in, make sure the spline shape is set to mask, but this time the blending is set to add. And there we go, we've got both of them. And we've got the ability of selecting them and changing the radius so we can increase and decrease the effect that that particular spline, once again, is having to create the vertex map to either you know control the light beam really small or expand it out. So I'm gonna keep it about, yeah, six is nice. So this is where we were at kind of like the other day and we thought, hey, this isn't too bad. You know, we've got a couple yeah. of vertex maps. Then we thought, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna add in something else. So I'm gonna create yet another tag. And I did change the name of the other one, didn't I? So I've got yes. yeah da, 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 glass. That one needs to be renamed as light beams. Ooh, how many V's are in light beams? Typing beam? like me. Yeah, typing there. And the last but not least is uh, we're gonna call this curve original with an S in it. Um, and what this will allow us to do is, under the fields, we can drag in the volume measure itself. And with our selection, we can add and create a curvature field, which allows us to get the curved edges of our object, which is absolutely great for kind of inverse ambient occlusion type style, mm. but, you know, for worn edges, roughness, and so on and so forth. So this was quite a nice kind of trick to play with and again you can expand it out until you can make the entire thing completely solid or you can drag it back and um, you know sort of temper it out a bit but then what we're going to do we're actually going to use additional things onto this to blend it out so I'm going to strangely enough create yet another vertex map which I'm going to rename um, curve final and in this, I'm going to drag and drop the other vertex map. And then what I can do, I go down to my curve and rather than nearest, I will use average. And give it a minute and an adjustment of the radius and you will see that I have the ability of blending this. So I can choose just how exactly, you know, solid this is. It does have to think about it, but then it's fine. So I think we were on something like, I'm just going to choose 15 because it was faded. You can see that that starts to fade out and that's giving me a much, you know, way too blended, you know, expanse across the vertex map. But if we bring it down to something like seven, it's not confining it completely to the polygons, which means that the edges aren't going to just all of a sudden cut off and it's going to allow us to blend those. Ellie then came up with an even better solution that we can add incredible shader fields to this as well. So we add in a shader field and in this shader field, we will add a noise because this noise, which is a little bit crazy here, we can subtract. Yep. Oh, brain. And now we can make it look more random where the weathering effect is going to be in the vertex map. This is something that we can kind of control within Redshift with the curvature field. But yeah. the, the, I want you to show the potential of what the vertex maps will allow us to do. And we can increase and decrease the um, what am I thumbnail. thumbnail. Yeah. Um, 
we can change the different types of noise, of course. I know you're a, you're a turbulence fan. Oh, yeah. So you can increase the turbulence, you can increase the scale, you can do all sorts of things that will allow you to mess around with where these vertex maps are being created and what particular material you can put on which section. Um, and with that, and the creation of all of our vertex maps that we have to give us the base, which we don't need a vertex map for because it's going to do all of it. We've got the glass, we've got the light beams, and then we've got a curve map, which gives us the original and the edit, which you can tweak with and make it yep. prettier. Um, <laughs> we can add materials to a volume meshed object. So away to you, Ellie. Thanks, Matt. It's all right. Cool, yeah, so as Matt was saying, now we have these vertex maps, we can now use them to define where certain materials are going to be inside of Redshift by doing some clever material blending, which we weren't really able to do before on a volume mesh object. So the only thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna exaggerate this shader a little bit more just so we can see this roughness. Um, so let me just up my low clip. And increasing the load means that there's a certain percentage of brightness data within the vertex map that it can only it can't go below. So yeah. it keeps that brightness up so that the materials will come through. Yeah. So everywhere that the yellow color is is going to be kind of like some like a worn material. So I'm going to leave it like that for now. That might be a bit too much, but it's so it can be represented on the stream and for you guys. Before we move on, there is something that we need to be aware of. We're just going to reorientate this so that it fits with our, you know, so that we've got the cylinder on the floor. And in order to do that, we need to make sure that we make the field objects that we have the children of the main object, because otherwise yes. we're going to move them. And the field's going to be in a different place and everything will go wonky. So if you are going to do this, make sure that your fields are a child of the object that you are going to move around to ensure that the vertex maps will stay in the same place. Yes. And I found that out earlier because I didn't do that. <laughs> the best way to learn, do it wrong first. Cool, so let me just do a very, very quick setup for this and then throw in a light and then we're gonna do some redshift magic. So let me just place this guy or girl or whatever on here. Boom. Cool, just get a little angle going on. Come out of here and there we go. Cool, so in order for me to start using Redshift, I need to do a couple of different things. And the first one is gonna be changing my renderer. So I just wanna change this to Redshift and this is gonna enable me to use things like Redshift lights, Redshift materials, and eventually render uh, with my Redshift. Cool, so from here, I'm actually just gonna set up my render view. And so everything I create in Redshift, materials, lights, are gonna show up in this view, not my, um, They'll show my viewport, but it won't give me a true representation like a final render would. So we can kick this off. Uh, we can see it's not looking too nice, but don't worry, we can we can do a few a few quick things to make this look good. So I'm gonna throw in a dome light, and this is just like a infinite ambient light for Redshift. I'm not too worried about creating some nice lighting. I wanna get more into the material. Let's throw this guy in here, and there we go, cool. So we're so done, thank you. Come it's on. already looking a little bit better than it was before, and this light's gonna help me get a nicer representation when I start creating materials. So let me just come in here, come into Redshift, and I'm gonna grab a standard material, and I'm gonna throw that onto my volume mesher. Everything's gonna go a default gray plastic, and that's cool, that's what I, that's what I expect. And so now let's work in our node editor. So I like to do a lot of material blending. It's where I spend most of my time creating different things, creating like scratches, roughness, blending things together to create my own version of materials. And also if we think about like stuff in the real world, not everything is perfect. People have like different roughness elements, different kind of worn edges. So that's what I like to do to create these materials that I see, I see around me. So let me actually dock my node editor just so I can see all my different windows going on, on my nice big screen <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that yeah. I've got here. <laughs> it's great that side. <laughs> so let me make a little bit more room for myself. Okay, cool. So what we can do, we can now use these vertex maps with material blending and I can start to define my different textures. So I'm gonna start from like the ground up. So my first material is gonna be the base material on here. And I'm gonna do a bit of a, like a, like a metal, let's, let's do a metal, metal why is not? Good. Let's, metal go, let's go with metal. So this is gonna be my metal material and I'm not normally this organized, but for the sake of a live session, I'm going to be. 
I was going to say, naming your stuff in 3D is one of the most important basic lessons we can ever partake to anybody. Otherwise, particularly when modeling, you end up with cube, 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 or cube, and trying to remember which one is the wall you need. Yeah. And I will admit that's exactly what I do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I've just added a metalness value uh, up to one, and that now gives me a metal material, nice and simple. And then I can define the base color as well. So let's go for a little bit of I thought you told a... me redshift was hard. This looks great already. A little bit of a bluey material. No, I don't know. Redshift, no, it's not that hard. It can do some really amazing technical things, but I like to show people that we can create nice materials with a simple light and a simple material without getting... Too bogged down yeah, in, in the getting complexity too into it, of it. Yeah. Let's um, add a little bit of roughness so we now have a more rough metal. That's how it works. Cool, so this is our base material. It's not looking too interesting, but it's cool. We could, there's things we can do a little bit later on, depending on time. So my next material, if I just copy this, I'm gonna now create my glass. So my first vertex map is my glass one. So I need to now create the glass material, and then we can start to do some blending magic. So let's come back into here, and this is gonna be my glass. And again, I'm just gonna create some really simple materials. So I've taken off my metalness because metalness won't work with transmission. And then if I increase and my transmission. Transmission is sort of transparency. It is literally how much light will transmit through something. Yes, so what people might know as refraction previously. Really? So as we can see, we've increased our transmission weight and our weight is effectively enabling this setting. We now have some, some glass going on. If I just remove my roughness, and then I can mess with my IOR. So I'm one of those people where if I'm not doing something that's physically accurate, I'm not too fussed about it. As long as it looks nice in the render view, that's, <laughs> that's my goal. I have a daft beginner's question. Yes. Why is it transparent at the moment when you haven't fixed the nodes together? Okay, so inside of my node editor, I can, if I come closer to here, I have this little S button, and this is gonna solo that particular material. And so because I haven't got everything set up, but I'm creating my material, I wanna be able to see what I'm creating. And so I can unsolo it, and it's gonna give me my normal kind of node tree, which in our case is just our metaness. Or I can solo it and see what I'm doing. It's, it's normally how I like to work. I do the same thing if I'm using like texture maps or noises. I solo it so I can see how it's projecting. And then I do my tweaking. Then you have to remember to unsolo. Sometimes I've done this. I'm like, why is my material looking like that? And I'm like, oh yeah. Where, where's all of the work I've done? I'm like, oh yeah, that big orange S. <laughs> cool, right. So we have our first two materials. We have our base one, which is our metal, and we have our glass. As we can see, it's not really doing what we want it to do. So now we can set up our material blending. So uh, nice and well-named, we can get ourselves a material blender. So if I grab this, I'm actually going to drop it on this line and Redshift is clever enough in the node editor to do my connections for me, which is great. Yeah, that makes it different from the shader graph, which is where you have to manually link all of the ports. Yes, exactly. So inside my Material Blender, if we just take a look at our attributes, we can see we have a base material. We have up to six different layers. Cool. And each of those has a material color. That's our texture. And a blend color. And the way I think of the blend color is a blending mask or a layer mask in Photoshop if you're used to things like that. So it's going to look at our black and white values, and it's going to determine how to mask between our different uh, textures or colors. So straight away, it's connected my base material. So that's great. But I now need to define my next material, which is my glass. So if I plug that in there, again, we're not seeing anything. But from here, this is where we can start to use our vertex maps as that blending mask. Because at the moment, it's going, I've got a blend, but I have no idea where I need to place this blend. So therefore, it needs exactly. something to say, go here. Okay, so the way that we use our vertex maps inside of here, we have to grab something called a vertex attribute node. And all it is, if we see on the bottom right down there, we can see all it needs is an attribute name, and that is our vertex map. Another reason why we name our vertex maps. So now I can just come in and drag, I'm pretty sure it's the second one, grab my glass, and if I solo my vertex attribute, we can now see the mask. So literally just like in Photoshop, where your blacks are and where your whites are, that is how it is masking between those things. And so from here, all I need to do is output that color 
into my blend color. And, and as if by magic, hey. we now have our two materials. So we have our base metal, we have our glass. And at any point, all of this can be changed. So I can change my metal, I can change my glass, I can even change my vertex map. It may be a case of dragging and drop it back in. Um, I'm not too sure, but in theory, this it is should, what we can do. It, it should, should update, update because but, it's uh, going straight to the vertex. Sometimes, sometimes these things don't, don't always happen. Helps. Yeah. Cool. Right. So now let's do our light beams uh, nice and quick. So let's just create another quick material. Let's get a standard material again. That's how I like to work. So some people might be used to the default material in Redshift. This is a newer version that came out in 3.5 in April, and it is just a much better optimized way of working. And I find it easier as well to create, create my materials. Cool, so let's go with, let's grab some emission because it's sci-fi, sci-fi. Everything's so got we, to have blinky lights on it. Everything has to have like, you know, those like teal lights flashing. So yeah, sci-fi only happens in cyan and teal, doesn't it? Nothing else. <laughs> So let's grab some emission. So we now have some emission, and this should kick in on the left in just a sec. There we go, cool. So we have our emissive material. Again, nice and simple, it's one little node. So even though we're building up our whole node tree, each material is just one simple node. And then we're adjusting our base properties to define the stuff that we need. So let's connect this again, exactly the same way we did before. Drop it in our material color. Grab this another- This time for layer two vertex attribute make sure we grab our light beams which i think is this, this one. one connect it in and blend color and then it's going to have a little think about it so it might take a little bit longer than like a normal material because we've got a lot of data now in our node editor we're using our vertex map information to blend between our materials so naturally it does take a little bit to think about it Okay, cool. So here we are. So, so far we've set up our three relatively simple materials and just sort of like dropped them inside of our render view. And now let's take advantage of that curvature of those worn edges and start to make this look a little bit more rough. So what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to copy this original material, which is just our metal base. And I'm going to make it a little bit lighter because this is going to be the color that's going to be, or the material that's going to be shining through underneath as if we've got like some metal, we've like whacked it on the side and we've, we see it chipped and whatever material you'd have underneath that. That's the way you have to think of material blending. These materials are going on top of one another and overriding whatever is below it. Let's maybe reduce our metalness, maybe do a bit more roughness. And now we can work from here. So for the final time, let's connect this into layer three. And the final vertex attribute node. Let's, create, let's make sure we need our final one as well. We don't want to grab the first one. We want to grab this one here. The one with the blending and then so the sort of like the extra final. noise on it. Yeah. And then we go blend color. Do, do, do. And then again, you know, it's just going to have a little think about that. I rearrange these while it's doing that. Cool, Ooh. now we can see that in there. So as I said, you know, we've exaggerated this just so it's like nice and obvious on the stream or in person for everyone to see. But what's nice as well, so as we said, you can always go back into the vertex maps and you can adjust this stuff. But one little trick, if, you, if you're like me and you like to work a lot in the, with Redshift and with texturing, then I can actually just grab a ramp and I can plug it into my vertex attribute. So if I solo that, it's gonna give me my black and white values because they're the black and white values that are coming from the vertex attribute. So in a minute, we can see them. And so what the ramp has, so the ramp serves so many purposes, but I'll just explain this one. So what it's gonna allow me to do, because we have our ramp gradient, I can now tweak my black and white values, which are my mask. So if I think, you know what, this is a little bit too intense, a little bit much going on, I can pull up that black knot. Give it a sec. And we're now taking away some of that. So if you'd prefer to do it in the texture or the material, you can do without necessarily having to go back into the vertex map. Maybe that's a little bit too intense. Let's pull that back a little bit. And another thing you could do, so if you find that you don't want. So the 100% white value that we have right now is gonna give 100% of this um, underneath 
metal texture. But if you don't want to have like a 100% value, again, in that ramp, we could just drop this down to a gray. To sort of like a, a light gray. And so we now we can see we're not getting 100% values. And now when I unsolo it, we're effectively clipping the color. It's a little bit less obvious, but perhaps more realistic. So I really like this setup. And for me, like we were never able to do this before. So you can do curvature inside of uh, Redshift by default, but we were never able to have this much control of our volume measure without making editable, setting up our own selections. And I think it's just like a really nice way of working. So let's let's finish this off because we've got we've got a little bit of we've time. Still got, we've still got 15 minutes. We're racing through this. We need something in the canister. <laughs> we do. So let me, for my own, uh, you know, peace of mind, set up a little bit of a floor in here and make this a little bit darker. So it's looking more similar to the original. And actually, you know what we can do? Why don't we? Why don't we do what I did? So as we said, you know, these at the moment, these materials are just individual standard materials with a few base properties. We've not really worried about anything too advanced apart from the material blending. But what if we want to have scratches? We want to have like different roughness values. So if I come to my metal base material, let's, let's solo it. Let's solo it so we can see that. So as we can see, we have our values here of zero to one, dependent on the type of material we're creating. We have a roughness value of 0.4. This is covering the entire object. So everything now has a roughness value of 0.4. But what if we want to have different parts of the model with different types of roughness, just like we would with objects and materials in the real world? Well, we can use noises, we can use texture maps, and we can plug those values into our different inputs. So let's do that. So if I come into my asset browser, hopefully I've got some surface materials here downloaded. Yep. Just download this quick asset. So what I can do, I can take this metal surface imperfection map and I'm gonna plug that into my roughness and our grayscale values will directly translate to different values of roughness. So if we just take a look at this. So what this texture map is gonna allow me to do, when I connect it into a roughness input, which remember is zero to one, zero being no roughness, one being 100% roughness, these directly translate to those values. Everything is 100% black, which we don't have too much. We have a little bit there in the middle. That is gonna be a roughness value of zero. So everywhere that this 100% black is on my object, is going to be shiny. Everywhere that is 100% white on my object is going to be 100% rough. So it's going to be it's going to be rough. And everything in between is going to be variations in between that. It means that the image that in front like that we've got in front of you means that you're going to get an interesting mix of anything between 0 and 100% roughness scattered about. So it's going to give a much more realistic look because nothing in the world is 100% shiny or 100% not or like direct in between. There are always going to be surface imperfections and this is one of the really wonderful quick ways of being able to bring that forward using, you know, like the blending material and the images. Yes. So I basically just drag and drop that into my node editor and the trouble is it's not projecting correctly straight away. So a nice little trick I use is the triplanar, which basically ignores the UVs and it's now projecting this in a much more accurate way. It effectively then goes, okay, literally triplanar, one, two, three. So I'll project from here, project from here, project from here and fake UV mapping so we don't have to worry about it. Exactly. So I've just scaled this down a little. It's going to think about that quickly. That's not quite right. Yeah, there we go. go. Cool, now I can plug this into the roughness input of my metal. If I just open up my little no tree here, I can plug this straight into my reflection roughness. And then what it's gonna do is it's now gonna control those different roughness values mm. on here. And as we can see, if we come to our metal, we've got our roughness, we're no longer able to control that input it's doing it directly inside of here. And we can do this with scratches. We can do this with noises. 
uh, whatever you need to do. And if you're using a Maxon noise or a noise element, you won't need to do the triplanar because it's clever enough to work out how to project correctly. OK, so we've done our material blending. We've done our vertex maps. We've set it up. But in the original one, we then created a bit of like a like a, like a gas gaseous thing element uh, in the middle. And we can do that really, really easily with, again, the volume builder to create our own version of a VDB, like we would make clouds. And then we can use a volume shader in Redshift, tweak a few things, and we can get some self-illuminating gas, like you'd find, I don't know, in Star Wars or something. <laughs> you nearly didn't know which one to say, did I, you, there? <laughs> I always love to embarrass myself, because I've never star seen Star Wars. Star something. Star one of them. <laughs> OK, cool. So what I'm going to do. Trick. So I'm going to steal the original, let's, let's steal the glass cylinder. So I'm going to copy that out. And I'm going to use this as the base of my VDB, which is going to be a volume inside my glass. All I need to do is make it a little bit smaller. Let's go 50 and let's maybe make this, oosh, what do we want to do? 160? Yeah, yeah let's go for that. This is just a rough guide, a rough shape. It's not going to end up looking like this. And for the sake of this, let's just hide my volume measure so we can see everything that's going on. So this is going to become my VDB. And we're going to drop this into a volume builder. So for anyone that wants to know how to create their own volumes or VDBs without having to worry about uh, X particles or like flume or things like that, then this is a, this is a way of getting some simpler ones. So I've thrown it into my volume builder, but we don't want sign distance field, which is the version or the mode that Matt used for his modeling. I want this to be fog. And we can see these tiny little dots here. And so if I decrease my voxel size, we can see we're getting a much more dense volume. But you're probably thinking, Ellie, I can't see anything in the render view. And I'd say, you're right. And this is because we need to set up our material now as well. We need to create a volume material to tell Redshift that this volume builder is a Redshift volume. So we're going to go to Create, Redshift, Materials, and Volume. Throw that on your Volume Builder. And there's a few things we need to set up. So let me just double click this. And again, I'm going to dot my node editor just so everyone can see everything that's going on. So inside my Redshift Volume, I need to do a few things. So at the moment, we have no channels. And we need to take what we call channel data from our VDBs. And so we can go to presets, we can go to the volume builder, because that's the channel that we need. And I can choose volume builder. And now we can start to see our volume inside of here. And it's looking a little bit strange, not looking like gas, but that's fine. We can, we can deal with that and we can fix that. So do you know what? That's all I'm going to set up for now. But I'm going to explain. So the, the scatter is like your diffuse, so I can control my color here. And then our absorption is kind of similar to our transparency or our density. So we can tweak these if we want to. But let's start by actually tweaking the VDB in my volume builder. So inside here, this is what we have going on so far. So if I grab, we have a couple of what we call filter layers. And it's going to allow me to really dial in how my volume and my VDB looks. So if I do a fog multiply, if I multiply it by 0, anyone that's uh, Good at maths, we'll know that. Multiplying by zero is near zero. as nothing as makes no odds. But once we have this, once we have this, we can now use fields to bring back some of that VDB or some of those areas. So if I head over to my fields menu, I can do my favorite field of IBC. Do you love your shader field? I mean, yeah. Normally it's random. Yeah, I'm a random field dude. I know, so it's random. You've been overtaken by shader. All I'm going to do is drop in a noise. I'm going to come in so you can already kind of see what's happening. We can see that that noise is effectively removing some of that volume. Or in our case, it's actually bringing it back because of our multiplier. Which, once again, is the black and white values. So wherever the black is, it's, got, it's not bringing it back. And, white and then the white bringing it is. It's all grayscale. <laughs> it's like a grayscale gorilla. Oh, that was good. Thank you. <laughs> Cool. So let's let's up some of these values. Uh, actually, let's, let's reduce this. Cool. Ooh. So we've gone a little bit too far on there. So you can see as I'm moving this high and low clip, we're bringing some of this stuff, some of our, our gas back. 
So this is a nice way of making like VDB clouds as well. But for me, because I'm just making like a gas element inside, I don't need to worry too much about um, the detail. As long as it looks like okay, then that's cool with me. Cool, so let's leave it like that for now. And then we can come back into our volume builder. And then one final thing I like to do, one final filter is a fog smooth. And as we can see, this makes this look really like a, like a like gas inside of there. I'm gonna reduce my voxel distance. And yeah. so now we have the VDB and we, could, we can tweak it, we can, we can define it even more if we want to inside of the volume builder. But for now, I'm just gonna leave it like this and I'm gonna come back to my volume shader and start to do some kind of magic with this. As we said, this is our, this is like our diffuse, this is our color. We're able to define a nice glow. And for the sake of speed, let me come into my emission for my light beams, copy my color, and come back into here, into here, and paste my color. Hooray. Okay, so we now have that color, but you're thinking, oh, it's not really like self-illuminating. It's not looking that like this like crazy glowing material like we had before. Well, if we come down to emission, we can define another channel and we can define an emission and now it's gonna be a self-emissive material. So I can come in again, make sure I select my volume builder. Now we can already see it's emitting. Paste that in here and we can up a scale is like the amount of this emission. So I can reduce this or I can increase this. And from here, I would then start to adjust my absorption. So if I increase my absorption, we can see like a transparency because I've got it self illuminating. This won't make too much of a difference. Okay. But our scatter coefficient will, so we can up this. It's going to create some. Oh, it sort of pushes it. Through so if the I, fog more. if I drop this, it will be a lot more obvious. I have no mission. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, redshift trick. If it doesn't update in the render view, hit the refresh, refresh button. <laughs> so yeah, we can start to increase and decrease this and you can see how it's affecting the density. So let's maybe cut that back down and let's bring this back up to maybe, yeah, yeah maybe two. And if we now pull this back and bring back our volume measure, you should have. We now have our gas inside of here. And what's great, as a final thing, I'm not gonna do it, and I didn't do it in the original, but if we come back to the volume builder and the VDB, inside of our fog multiplier, inside of our field, not shader field, we can actually animate the shader field noise. And so then what would happen is if I then rendered this, my gas would be animating. So it'd look really nice. And there we go, in, with one minute to spare, Nailed we it. have done our scene. <laughs> yes. So thanks so much, everyone. Thank you.